directors of the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering. And he, he will give us insights on science and technology ecosystems and how we can make them contribute to emerging economies like the Philippines. I, for, for one, am very impressed with how scientists like Joel has been coming back to the Philippines every so often to share whatever expertise they have. So for today, I look forward to having a fruitful discussion with you all this afternoon. Let me thank everyone for coming here today. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Reyes. So just a bit of introduction about our speaker today. He is an immediate past president and member of the board of directors of the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering in 2019, and a corresponding member of the National Acad a Academy of Science and Technology Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, let's all welcome Dr. Joel Coelho. We're gonna dim the lights a little bit. I always tell my students I look better in the dark. <laughs> no, the glare is just bothering me a little bit. Okay. So thank you so much for having me here. I'd like to thank the IDS, of course, uh, President Celia Reyes. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time and beating the traffic to be here this afternoon. That's really appreciated. All right, so uh, without further ado, uh, the topic of this seminar is 10 laws of innovation ecosystems in emerging economies. But I'd like to show you a bunch of pictures here, just to kind of give you a background of why or how I've been interested in this topic. Um, it all started with my abiding interest in globalization. And I became a student of globalization because um, my academic and research activities for the past 24 years have taken me to different countries. And so in the past 24 years, I've witnessed myself uh, the transformative changes that globalization has effected on many countries around the world, uh, in all the continents. <clears throat> so this is a picture that was taken in December 1999. Uh, this was in Japan. Uh, this is uh, Prof Professor Toyoki Kozai. <clears throat> of Chiba University. I was there on a short-term JSPS uh, fellowship as an assistant professor at the University of Arizona at that time. Um, there's a laser. <laughs> but this is me, in case you don't recognize. And these were grad students of Professor Kozai. They call this the end of the year, or forget, forget the, the year, year party. party. <laughs> and, and so, so the, the grad, grad students, students were partying, partying like, like it was 1999, 1999 because, because it was 1999. 1999. <laughs> So, so anyway, anyway uh, between, between, I've, I've been, been a, a professor, professor now for 24, 24 years, years, and, and until, until 2000, 2000, my main destination was always Japan. Japan. <laughs> 2000, my main destination became China. And uh, <clears throat> that was uh, kind of uh, a good uh, coincidence, because starting in 2000 or 2001, that's when China acceded to the World Trade Organization. And that, and that was China, China. That's, that's what, what was when China, China became really uh, officially opened as a uh, powerhouse uh, in the global economy. This was back in 2000. That was my very first time in China. I was invited to Yunnan Agricultural University. And that was my, the beginning of my romance with China. I've been back to China probably 10 times now. Um, and um, that really opened my eyes in terms of the power of globalization, in terms of transforming an entire society. And um, about 2009, so that's 10 years ago, I was given a Lifetime Visiting Professorship Award at uh, Zhejiang University. And that's why annually I'm supposed to go back to China, uh, though that hasn't really happened, but, uh, <laughs> but now I'm, I'm starting to, uh, to do that anyway. And this is at Zhejiang University, and these are grad students. Um, some of these grad students have spent time in my laboratory at the University of Arizona. And this is a company, Everfine, uh, that collaborated with me in the past and also was collaborating with Zhejiang University. So again, it was a good um, time for me to witness what was going on in an emerging economy like China, where the government, 
uh, the academe or university and private companies were collaborating um, intimately uh, to be able to advance the economy. Uh, this is in South Korea at Seoul National University. Uh, this one is in Singapore. This is in India. This one is in Norway, where I have a long-term collaboration with uh, a company. Uh, this is, okay, so I've been traveling to all these countries. I was really fascinated about globalization. I was doing a lot of readings. And I thought to myself, well, I'm spending so much time reading about globalization. I should make this a part of my uh, daily uh, activities or of my regular day job. And so I started offering a course in globalization, sustainability, and innovation at the University of Arizona. I believe that was around 2006. So this is in 2008 or 2009. So for two summers, I offered it at the University of Stuttgart in Germany through a uh, study abroad program. So these are American students at the University of Arizona who enrolled in the course. And this is in Munich, Germany, when we attended a conference there. So that's another class that I had on globalization also at the University of Stuttgart. And I offer the same course at Palestine Polytechnic University in the West Bank. So because of this international exposure and myself witnessing, again, the transformative effects of globalization, it really became clear to me. And over the years, I was able to discern these 10 laws of innovation ecosystems in emerging economies. So before we get into that, so let's uh, talk about what is an s and innovation ecosystem, just to make sure we have the same understanding. So a tropical rainforest is an example of an ecosystem, and it's a good uh, allegory. So in an ecosystem, there's soil, there's sunlight, there's rain, there's temperature, humidity, habitats, uh, and other species. And a tropical rainforest is a dynamic and interactive environment that produces and sustains a rich variety of species, which constitutes the innovation of the rainforest system. So those particular, uh, particular aspects of the tropical rainforest produce this rich variety of species. OK, so there's a tropical rainforest, and the innovation of the rainforest is the rich variety of species. Now, there's a different type, another type of ecosystem, and that's a technology or an SMT innovation ecosystem. And of course, the archetype that we have is always Silicon Valley. So Silicon Valley comprises companies, universities, researchers, engineers, students, investors, government, research centers, global partners. And collectively, they're working together to produce or produces a rich variety of technology products and services. And that constitutes the innovation of this ecosystem. So we have these two ecosystems here. So there's a tropical rainforest. The innovation is the rich variety of biological species. And the SD innovation ecosystem. And the outcome is the rich variety of SMT products and services. So of course, today, every country in the world would like to establish their own Silicon Valley innovation ecosystem. And of course, that's not possible. It's not possible to duplicate Silicon Valley. Why? Because the factors that make it possible uh, vary or change from location to location. But it's possible to have your own unique innovation ecosystem. It's not just going to be the same or exactly the same. So why does the Philippines need an s and innovation ecosystem? Well, we can look at it from the supply and demand perspective. Um, so on the supply side of the Philippine s and program, you have improving s and education. So Chad is involved in that. Uh, establishing the R&D capacity. So DOST is involved in that. Innovation readiness, s and graduates, and so on and so forth. Government and universities uh, <clears throat> work together to make this happen. Now, if you look at the demand side, um, there's local enterprises, there's global companies. However, uh, their number is not enough to be able to absorb all of the s and graduates here. And so the result is there's a component, a big component, a significant component of the graduates that end up elsewhere. And that is brain drain. <clears throat> so to be able to remedy the situation, uh, there is a need for the demand side to be expanded 
to be able to match the supply side. And this involves the development of the innovation ecosystem. So that would require foreign direct investments, global partners, and uh, then the demand side would be uh, boosted and then would then correspond with what's being produced on the supply side. So this is our focus here. How do we build this innovation ecosystem? Um, what are the laws that govern it? <clears throat> All right, so here's a snapshot, and we're gonna go through this one by one. These are the 10 laws of innovation ecosystem. Uh, the first one is the law of sector partnership, uh, whole government approach, global linkages, manufacturing and industrial R&D, uh, value linkages, technopreneurship, technology transfer, convergence, fundamental sciences, and values. So let's go through this one by one. So the first one is the law of sector partnership. It states that s and innovation ecosystems are built successfully on the bedrock of cohesive government, industry, university partnerships. So if you look at the developed countries of Europe and North America, uh, like Germany or Switzerland or the United States or Canada, these are countries with established uh, s and innovation ecosystems. But if you look at their history, it actually took them centuries to get to where they are at today. Um, the development of their research intensive uh, educational institutions and companies took centuries to develop. But uh, there are other emerging economies like the Philippines, like Singapore, like Thailand. So how then do they facilitate and accelerate the development of their own s and innovation ecosystem so that it becomes a deliberate uh, purpose for them, mission-driven. Okay, so um, we can look at these countries here, Singapore, Israel, Taiwan, China, Vietnam. Deliberate and orchestrated establishment of s and innovation ecosystems for economic competitiveness and growth through government, industry, university partnerships. So basically, this is how they do it or how they've done it, is uh, they're able to form deliberately and they're able to accelerate the process of developing these innovation ecosystems through government, industry, university partnerships. You cannot point to any emerging economy in the world with an emerging s and innovation ecosystem without this government, industry, and university partnership. So I highlighted here Singapore, China, and Vietnam. I colored them red. What's the common thing among those countries? What type of governments do they have? <clears throat> They're autocratic governments. And Israel and Taiwan, they're liberal democracy, right? But all of them have a bustling s and innovation ecosystem. So in other words, it's really not a function of the form of government. One may be communist, one may be a liberal democracy. Uh, one is still able to uh, establish a viable and bustling innovation ecosystem. And the first law is through government, industry, university partnership. Okay, and this is the relationship among the government, the companies, and R&D universities and centers. And this is how you're able to produce sustained value creation. That's innovation. And these are the forms of relationships uh, between the three actors. Okay, so let's look at China here. Uh, this is Zhejiang University in Hangzhou, China. Again, this is where I have the uh, Lifetime Visiting Professorship. Um, one of the companies that's collaborating with uh, Hangzhou or with uh, Zhejiang University is Alibaba. And I should know, Al who's not familiar, who's familiar with Alibaba? <laughs> All right, everyone is. <laughs> okay, so this was last year. And so because uh, the laboratory where I was a guest of has a relationship with Alibaba, so 
they gave us a tour of the campus of Alibaba in Hangzhou. And it's just like being in Silicon Valley. The atmosphere is so different. It really encourages innovation and free thinking. So that's Alipay. All right, so that's the first law. <laughs> Second law is the law of whole government approach. So it, says, it states that real intergovernment cooperation is a sine qua non or an absolute requirement for building successful s and innovation ecosystem. This law is really, really important, um, especially for an emerging economy. In other words, there has to be really a deepened cooperation and collaboration among the government units in a country to be able to establish a successful s and innovation ecosystem. And you can look at each one of these countries, Singapore, Israel, Taiwan, China, Vietnam, and you will see that they have an extremely coherent policy and implementation protocol for the establishment, for the oversight, and for the expansion of their s and innovation ecosystems. Uh, without this, it's very hard for the s and innovation ecosystem in an emerging economy to uh, become successful. And this one is a government-led effort. So you don't wait for the private uh, sector to do this. The government in, of an emerging economy really has to uh, take the lead. So in the case of Israel, they have an Israel Innovation Authority. So this is like their umbrella organization or government agency. Uh, it's their superseding um, government agency that coordinates with the various uh, other government agencies that have to do with innovation. Um, and so uh, this acts as a lead uh, government agency for promoting innovation across sectors in Israel. In the case of Singapore, there's the Agency for Science, Technology, and Research, uh, which coordinates uh, very tightly with the private industry. Uh, in Singapore, they really have a very explicit policy and implementation uh, for connecting research to innovation to enterprise. And again, this government agency is taking the lead in terms of making sure that, that that connection is implemented. So in the Philippines, uh, if we take a look at the relationships among government companies and R&D universities and centers, it would look something like this. So DOSD and CHED, for instance, provides grants uh, that uh, you know, provide collaboration between the government and the R&Ds uh, universities and centers. Companies also provide contracts, government and companies incentives. Um, in my observation though, this is what it looks like. So you have global manufacturing uh, taking place here. There's a lot of industrial parks. And then you have small medium enterprises and then you have a few s and entrepreneurs, then universities are in these centers, and here's the government. And they're kind of like in separate silos, right? But to make this effective, they have to be put together this way. <laughs> and the only way you can go from this to this is by the government actually catalyzing it so that you can have this tight cooperation. So therefore, the Philippines requires a deepened cooperation among DTI, BOI, DOSD, CHED, and research universities and institutions. Without the deepened cooperation, it's hard uh, to be able to establish a coherent uh, innovation ecosystem. Okay, so now we go to law number three, the law of global linkages. So global linkages and partnerships are an absolute necessity for s and innovation ecosystems to survive and flourish. All right, so we're talking about emerging economies. In emerging economies, particularly, um, you know, those countries that are just in the process of establishing innovation ecosystems, they don't have a lot of money. There's not a lot of capital available. So the question is, where do you get the money? 
<laughs> well, we're now in a globalized world, and capital is basically zooming around the world. <laughs> and so this is why it's important to have global linkages, so that you can uh, have these linkages not only to access knowledge, not only to access expertise, but also to access uh, financial capital. So in 2016, foreign investment in Israel almost doubled from 6.5 billion to 11.1 billion dollars. And foreign investors have traditionally been American or European, but her, there has been growing interest from Asia, especially from China. We're talking about Israel here. While American investments fell in 2016 by 41 percent to 1.8 billion, Asian investments, of which two-thirds were Chinese, increased by threefold to 6.4 billion dollars. So Israel is called a startup nation, correct? It's a highly innovative country. However, that's made possible uh, to a significant degree by global linkages, especially in terms of uh, financial capital. In the case of Singapore, Singapore offers multinational corporations a wide spectrum of science and engineering capabilities available within a small, compact location, seamless access to these capabilities across different research institutions, and the rich diversity of world-class talent present in those institutions. That is why right from the start, since uh, Singapore became an independent country in 1965, it was able to attract a lot of foreign direct investment into the country. So today, in a globalized world, uh, companies now, global companies, are into, open innovation, into the open innovation model. So it used to be that in the United States, there's the Bell Laboratories, right? So in the Bell Laboratories, they have their own in-house R&D. But that's way too expensive now. And therefore, uh, global companies are now seeking to partner with uh, public universities in different countries to be able to do R&D. So globalization, technological advances, increased connectivity, and intensifying competition have led many companies to turn away from traditional Bell Labs approach of internal R&D. Multinational corporations partner more aggressively with public research performers across the globe. So for instance, Procter & Gamble, between 2000 and 2006, increased their R&D productivity by almost 60%, more than doubled their innovation success rate, and doubled their share price while lowering their cost of innovation. Their R&D investment as a percentage of sales decreased from 4.8% in 2000 to 3.4% in 2006. So this is also the reason as to why there's a lot of companies now that are seeking to establish uh, R&D laboratories or R&D centers in emerging economies. And I think that's one of the things that the Philippines should capitalize on. Um, in Singapore, through public sector research has grown in intense, or, or though public sector research has grown in intense and excellence, that of enterprises, especially local enterprises, has yet to grow at a corresponding rate. Um, all right. So this is one of the challenges in Singapore. Um, a lot of the R&D, um, industrial R&D that's being performed in Singapore are foreign, not local. But that is fine. But the challenge for them is also to increase the R&D of their local or domestic companies. So multinational corporations by and large dominate in many R&D intensive industry clusters, such as electronics, pharmaceuticals, and biomedical sciences. This is in Singapore. Okay. If you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt. All right. Uh, law number four is the law of manufacturing and industrial R&D. The tandem of manufacturing and industrial R&D is an absolute requirement for S&T innovation ecosystems to get built, grow, and thrive. So if you look at the trajectory of development of countries, <clears throat> so it starts with agriculture and mining. That's the precondition for takeoff. And then after that, there's manufacturing. There has to be manufacturing for industrial industrialization to happen. And that's the takeoff. 
Then after that, we have to add R&D. So manufacturing and R&D, that's when you begin to drive innovation. And then ultimately, it's high-tech innovation or knowledge-based value creation. That's the drive to sustain growth. And this is what's being encompassed by s and innovation ecosystem. So today, China is the factory of the world, right? But China is not content in just being the factory of the world. It wants to become the innovation center of the world as well. And, and that is why China now is very much heavy into research and development and innovation, into artificial intelligence, into uh, neural networks, and so on and so forth. Um, and in the case of India, what is India? If China is the factor of the world today, what is India? India would be the service center of the world, right? But India is not interested in just being the service center of the world. It also wants a piece of the manufacturing from China. So this is just uh, recent here, Samsung, which is the South Korean uh, giant multinational corporation, has just established a phone factory in India. So Samsung's mobile phone factory in India will be the largest in the world. It's now under construction, and close to 30% of the handsets will be made and uh, will be exported from India. So <laughs> uh, India also would like to have a slice of the manufacturing pie uh, for the world. Okay, and Israel. So when we think of Israel, we only think about the startup companies in Israel. But the way Israel started is also through manufacturing. Uh, and that began in 1974 with Intel. And it's still in Israel today. Uh, and it is today's uh, largest technology employer in Israel. And it's exporting billions of processors. In fact, uh, 40 years since 1974, it exported over a billion processors. So Pentium, Centrino, all of those were designed in Israel and also were manufactured in Israel. Uh, but at the same time, Israel has a lot of industrial R&D centers. There are more than 200 com 250 companies that have R&D labs in Israel. 80 of them uh, are Fortune 500 companies. So you name it, Google, Facebook, Apple, uh, Huawei, which belongs to China, Samsung, which belongs to South Korea. They have R&D centers in Israel. In fact, if you are supposed to be a uh, who's who in technology, you gotta have our R&D center in Israel. Um, HP has eight. So the Philippines needs to have some R&D, international R&D centers uh, from uh, a lot of these companies. Okay, so I visited Israel last July. This is Tel Aviv. Uh, this is my colleague, Zvi Herman, and he gave me a tour of one of the innovation uh, ecosystem industrial parks near the airport. And uh, we just drove around, and you can see all of these companies here, Siemens, AT&T, uh, and so on, so Motorola. They have presence in Israel. Uh, Unilever. And that's the Office of the Israel Innovation Authority in this campus. So three examples of Israeli innovation, cent uh, innovation sectors. You've got automotive 2.0. So cybersecurity, uh, accelerators, connected car, manufacturing, and so on and so forth. Uh, this one is for agri-tech. And this one is for cybersecurity, of which uh, Israel is really a major global player. So how does the Israeli government maintain focus on building s and innovation ecosystems? As I've mentioned before, it's through the Israel Innovation Authority. Uh, then in Palestine, I go to the West Bank. Uh, I collaborate with universities there. And, and today with the Higher Council for Innovation and in, uh, Excellence. Um, as you know, the West Bank is a difficult place. Um, it's uh, divided into various areas. Area A is under Palestinian control. 
Area C is under Israeli control, but you can see that Area A is not one contiguous area, but it's broken up. Uh, and so that's a challenge for the Palestinians. Uh, mobility within the West Bank is, is not so easy. Um, and it's also dotted by many uh, Israeli military checkpoints. And there are Israeli settlements within the West Bank. Okay, so here's a contrast here. So this is inside the West Bank. Uh, this is Area C, which is under Palestinian control, but then you have this Israeli settlement. And the Israeli settlement is not just places or houses where people live. They have an industrial complex in there. So this is a manufacturing facility in a uh, Israeli settlement in the West Bank. So that means that they're manufacturing in there. They're producing stuff, and then they're selling them to Israel, some of them they sell to the West Bank, some of it they export outside of Israel. So they're building their own innovation ecosystem, so to speak, inside the settlements. But in the case of the Palestinians, there's a lot of things that are prohibited for them. They're not able to manufacture you know, things related to heavy industries. And so there's not a lot that they can do. But they still have to try, okay, so here's another one, Israeli settlement industrial zone. Okay. But the Palestinians, they have to innovate as well, right? So how do they do that? So they do that through the Higher Council for Innovation and Excellence. So this is kind of like the analogous agency for the Israeli Innovation Authority. So this is uh, President Mahmoud Abbas of Palestine. And I'm cooperating with them uh, through the Palestine Higher Council for Innovation and Excellence and Al-Quds Open University. Uh, and this is engineer Adnan Samara, who's the president of the Higher Council. Uh, that's the president of Al-Quds Open University. And this is one cooperating company in that particular work that we're working on, which is using algae as a supplement for animal feed. Okay, so one of the sectors of the Palestine innovation ecosystem is high value bioproducts. Now the others, again, there's so many limitations, so I don't know what those would be. Now, in the case of the Philippines, uh, there's a Department of Trade and Industry, and uh, through various roadmaps and development plans, uh, they, uh, the Philippines has actually been developing its uh, manufacturing industry. So if you look at the, let's see, this one is export from the Philippines in 2016. So you can see that 28% is integrated circuits. So that's, that's high tech. Computers, 8.3%. Uh, 5% semiconductor devices, 2% uh, bananas. Okay, so it would be great if this could be further expanded and diversified. Okay, so these are the export destinations uh, of the Philippines. There's China, which is big, 19%. Hong Kong, Japan, Singapore. United States is 13% which is significant as well. Germany, 4.3%. Uh, now, look at the total uh, export is 78 billion. So we go to import, total is 92.9 billion. So there's a trade deficit, as you can see. Uh, but in terms of import, the, the biggest one is integrated circuits at 13%. Uh, refined petroleum, 5.6%. Cars, 4.3%. And these are the import origins, China, Japan, Thailand, Singapore, Indonesia, United States. Those are the big ones. So emerging s and innovation clusters in the Philippines, and this is based on the Department of Trade and Industry, based on the studies that they have done. That would be automotive, electronics, electrical, aerospace parts, chemicals, uh, shipbuilding, biotechnology, 
food processing. So these are the emerging industries that the Philippines needs to get into. And again, <laughs> that would require really intensive cooperation among DTI, DOSD, and other pertinent government agencies. And the crucial key here is not just manufacturing, but R&D as well. R&D has to be in there. And I don't mean R&D that's funded by the government, but R&D that's funded by uh, global companies, right? So that, again, the Philippines can go up the value chain. So manufacturing, manufacturing plus R&D, and then high-tech innovation, knowledge-based value creation. So here's the Economic Complexity Index that was published by MIT. And it's a measure of the knowledge intensity of an economy. And the, uh, the Philippines was ranked number 45 with a value of 0.434. So you can compare the knowledge intensity of uh, Philippine manufacturing versus these other countries here. So this is about half of that of Malaysia, about half of China, and a certain percentage of Israel, about 50%, I suppose, 60%. Uh, Japan is the top one, so Japan is more than five times that of the Philippines. Okay, number five. <laughs> We're getting there. So the law of value chain linkages. Domestic S&T-based small and medium enterprises are fostered through value chain linkages with S&T global companies with manufacturing and or R&D operations within the country. So it's important to develop a country's own small medium enterprises, but how do you help them succeed? Well, one way to do that is to plug them into the value chain or the supply chain of these multinational corporations. And Singapore actually does this. And that is why Singapore is able to foster its own small, medium enterprises uh, by linking them to the supply chain of the multinational corporations. So that's one way that the Philippines could do as well uh, to be able to develop its own s and companies is to plug these local companies into the supply chain of the multinational corporations that are operating here. All right, law of technopreneurship. Uh, given their initially feeble local venture capital industry, emerging economies that build dynamic global link manufacturing and industrial R&D sectors are significantly enabled to foster technopreneurship. So, um, technopreneurship is very important, but for an emerging economy, you can't just be doing that because there's no money, there's no investment, right? There's no venture capital that's available or there's not a lot that's available in an emerging economy. And so it's very important really to develop this uh, globally linked manufacturing and industrial R&D sectors together with promoting uh, technopreneurship. Uh, what happens is when there are industrial R&Ds uh, or industrial R&D centers in an emerging economy, they actually provide mentoring of startups and access to resources and overseas investment. This is what's happening in Israel now. Um, the R&D centers of global companies in Israel are actually helping the local small and medium enterprises in Israel, providing them mentorship, providing them access to resources and overseas investment. And ultimately, those uh, companies that have R&D centers in Israel, they acquired those local companies. They buy them out. Uh, for instance, Lenovo, Xiaomi, and Fosun, these are companies in China. Uh, they have acquired Israeli startup companies to complement or kickstart their new R&D labs in Israel. So it's not just Western companies that are buying uh, is, uh, Israeli companies, the small and medium enterprises in Israel. But even Chinese companies, Korean companies are doing the same thing. All right, so here's the question. In an emerging economy, uh, there's not a lot of venture capital available. So how does then the government of that emerging economy catalyze the growth of venture capital? 
So the story of Israel is uh, one of its programs is called YOSMA, which means initiative. So it was established in 1993, and it invested around $80 million for 40% stake in 10 new venture capital funds. To further attract foreign investors, the program offered them insurance covering 80% of the downside risk and gave them the option to buy out the government share at a discount within five years. And then to minimize risk, the funds were required to coordinate many of their investments. Yosma also set up its own $20 million fund to invest directly in small companies. And of its 15 portfolio companies, nine went public or were acquired. So uh, this program here, Yosma, really catalyzed the growth of venture capital in Israel. Okay, this will go quickly now. Love technology transfer. This is very important as well. Commercial transfers of proprietary technologies from academic and government R&D institutions to private industry directly strengthen a country's s and innovation ecosystem. So again, in Israel, Yisum, this is the technology transfer company of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. So this is a company. This is not part of the university. It's a company that is working for the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. It has over 9,300 patents and 110 spin-offs to its name. It's a 52-year-old company, the third oldest in the world of its kind, and works closely with researchers at the university and connects them to commercial partners. It creates an average of 10 new companies annually with some, like Mobileye, valued over $9 billion today. $2 billion in annual sales, and this is what Yusum earns. 60% of companies' income goes toward researchers and their laboratories, creating 300 new positions each year, with the rest recycled back into the company and the university. So it's no surprise that Tel Aviv University, the Weizmann Institute, and the Technion, which have their own uh, technology transfer companies, are among the top 10% applicants, patent applicants in the US. So this is one model, I think, that uh, should be considered in the Philippines. Uh, the good thing about having a, a technology transfer company is that they're going to be very aggressive in promoting uh, and linking um, the universities to global companies where those uh, technologies would be uh, very valuable. Now, this is Taiwan. Oh, no, this is the website for Yisum. And uh, this is the, they have a list of available technologies on their website. So agriculture, chemistry and materials, clean tech, computer science and engineering, food and, and so on and so forth. So all of the, those major universities in Israel, all of them are producing intellectual property in all of these categories. And they're being aggressively marketed. Uh, each tree, this one is the Industrial Technology Research Institute. This one is for Taiwan. Uh, I think this was established in 1973. So each is a nonprofit R&D organization engaging in applied research and technical services. I only got aware of this recently because a scientist from E3 came to visit me at the University of Arizona wanting to collaborate with me. So I interviewed him, well, what, what is E3? So it turns out it's a company. It's not part of the university, but it's a not-for-profit uh, company. They, have, they employ their own scientists, and they're collaborating with universities in Taiwan as well. Their goal is to do research, and produce innovation and patents. So they've got lots and lots of patents, and they sell those patents or they license those patents worldwide. So if you look at the website of Itri, uh, they have this uh, uh, they have these events, including one in Las Vegas, again to aggressively promote and market their intellectual properties. So that's there's a business model behind it, and it's really quite effective. All right, so we've gone to number seven. <laughs> but I just want to kind of want to have a, a recap here. So at the very base, there's the sector partnership, the government, 
the industry and the university or the academia have to have this close cooperation. That's the foundation of an innovation ecosystem in an emerging economy. Then on top of that, there has to be that whole government approach. Uh, there has to be that cohesive relationship in the pertinent government agencies and units to be able to implement innovation. And there has to be global linkages. I mean, face it, emerging economies, they don't have enough money, they don't have enough investments. But there's a lot of investments that are floating around in the global market. And so one has to plug one's country to um, the global um, uh, sources for funding, for technologies, and so on and so forth. Then once you have this three, then you can have these four parallel things going on at the same time. Manufacturing and industrial R&D. Uh, value linkages of small, medium enterprises within the country. Plug them to the value or supply linkages of the multinational corporations. So you can develop your own science and technology companies. Then technopreneurship and technology transfer. And then those three on top, those are the icing in the cake. <laughs> um, one is the law of convergence, which is the fourth industrial revolution. I'm, I'm saying that it's an icing on the cake, half jokingly only, because this is going to be the future. Enhanced value creation in the 21st century takes place at the convergence of very disciplinary domains, particularly at the intersections of the physical, the digital, and the biological. So manufacturing is important for all developed countries. Um, and in the future, manufacturing is going to be completely redefined by the fourth industrial revolution. It's now being redefined, being transformed by the fourth industrial revolution. And so uh, really, every emerging country has to pay, uh, to pay attention as well to uh, the fourth industrial revolution. But again, for an emerging economy, without these seven laws here being uh, abided by, then it, it's hard to implement the fourth industrial revolution. There, there's nothing to apply it to. Okay, then the law of fundamental sciences. I know that uh, in emerging economies, a lot of professors are complaining that they don't have enough money to do the fundamental sciences. The thing though is, once you have this seven here, the country is going to have more revenues, and therefore there's more money available uh, to be able to do fundamental sciences. So fundamental sciences in the 21st century flourish best wherever built s and innovation ecosystems thrive. And finally, the law of values. The enabling values of a nation, including family cohesion, quality of life, community esprit de corps, global cooperation and teamwork for progress and development, both motivate and shape the building of its s and innovation ecosystem. So in the case of Singapore, when it became an independent country in 1965, they didn't have anything. It's a very small country. Uh, they didn't have a lot of uh, funds. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, natural resources, but they had their people. So their president at that time, Lee Kuan Yew, said that, we have to develop our people because they are our best capital. And we have to be number one in science and technology in the Asian region. And so he really uh, promoted education, he promoted s and he promoted R&D, um, and the building up of an innovation ecosystem. And so, again, this is innovation ecosystem establishment is value driven. So in the case of the Philippines, of course, Filipinos value all of these things, family cohesion, quality of life, community uh, esprit de corps, and so on and so forth. And um, those must be guiding principles for government officials, government agencies, to really work together so that they can implement and establish and cultivate a dynamic innovation ecosystem. So this is, these are the 10 laws in summary. I was meaning to write a paper for this in time for this presentation, but I got sick, so I lost that window of time, but I will be doing this. And um, I, I will send, of course, the, the paper once I'm finished. Uh, and, and this is just like a summary here. So this is proposed 
a five-pronged strategy for building the Philippine SNC innovation ecosystems. So these are the five approaches: building global SNC manufacturing, uh, growing SNC manufacturing with R&D, building global SNC R&D, uh, tech startups and small medium enterprises, and producing local MBAs in technology and global trade. And those are the investments, and these are the return on investments. Mm. Oh, I like this year. The best time to plant the Philippine innovation ecosystem tree was 20 years ago, but the second best time is now. Of course, that's based on a Chinese proverb. And that's it. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. Thank you for enduring my voice. <laughs> but uh, we're not finished yet. This is the time where you know you ask questions and I provide answers to your questions. Okay? Yes, please. Thank you very much, sir. I'm uh, Dan Agustin of uh, Land Bank Subsidiary Masagana. Uh, you mentioned uh, Israel, uh, Singapore, uh, who appears to be models. May I know uh, where did they get the, the training? Is it from the US, from Russia? Or? Thank you very much. The training. You mean the educational training of their government? I, I don't, I don't, yes, yes, I don't, I don't think, think that, that it came, came from, from one location. location. One thing one I can, can say, say about, about Israel, Israel and uh, Singapore, Singapore, again, yeah, they, they were both small, small countries. countries. They, they started, started with nothing, nothing virtually nothing. nothing. Uh, uh, Israel, you know, was a, a desert. desert. And uh, it became a nation in 1948. Um, and most of its population came from somewhere else, from Europe, you know, after the Holocaust. And they were surrounded by Arab countries who were not in favor of establishing Israel. Um, that was, the, that was the, the background. And so they really had to have this mentality of self-preservation and survival, and also of developing whatever they have. Uh, not based on natural resources, but based on, um, uh, based on knowledge. So they, had, they knew that they had to develop, to develop a knowledge-based economy, an innovation-heavy economy, or innovation-based economy. The same thing with Singapore. So the only thing different about Singapore was that it was not surrounded by hostile territories. Uh, but just the same, they didn't have a lot of natural resources. It's a small location. Uh, and so they had to develop uh, an economy that is based heavily on knowledge and innovation. Yes. If I may follow up, because uh, we Filipinos uh, were trained uh, the American way, was there any adverse effect on this on Filipinos? Okay, so I, I think that's a fair question, and I think that, um, you know, because I was born here in the Philippines and I grew up here and I went to UP Los Banos here. Then at the same time, I went to grad school in the Philippines and I've been, I mean, in the US and I've been living there now and working there for uh, 32 years now. So I think I can kind of objectively answer that question. So um, I think one downside of that. Uh, very intimate relationship, historical relationship, cultural relationship between the Philippines and the U.S. is that the Philippines always looks to the U.S. But the thing is, it's hard to compare the Philippines with the U.S. because the, Philipp the U.S. is a fully developed economy. And the U.S. is just, I mean, the Philippines is just starting to develop. So if you look to, if the Philippines looks to the U.S. for patterns, a lot of those things do not apply directly to the Philippines. So that could be one potential pitfall for the Philippines. Uh, and that is why in this presentation here, I, I intentionally uh, use as illustrations the emerging economies in Asia, mainly. I mean, Israel is also in Asia. Uh, because their stories are more 
compatible with the Philippines because they're more or less in the same development stage. Uh, another thing is the Philippines is, I mean, the U.S. is a huge country. The Philippines is such a small country. So a lot of things do not apply directly. But of course, there's a lot of positives as well. I'm just pointing out one potential people. Yes. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, my name is Bill. We met earlier. I think you've explained uh, the how, right? Uh, rather, the what of uh, how to develop SNT-based uh, innovation in an emerging economy. And I think we, we, we learn from this. The, the question of how do we bring it about in a country? Who will do it? Right? These are the more challenging questions. And, but I think abstractly, it's not enough to address that. It's also the question of we have to move fast. Right? In other words, we cannot perhaps say take 20 years because we have to somehow catch up. Maybe it's a bad word to say catch up, but we have to. Otherwise, how can we be internationally competitive, right? And even in domestic, in our domestic requirements, we need to be able to meet our requirements. So my, my thinking, and perhaps you can respond to it, is that your number seven and number eight, the technology transfer and perhaps the fourth industrial revolution are perhaps the key things that can pull together all these other things so that we can move things fast. In other, in other words, we have to have all these elements, but how we bring about how these elements contribute to the whole effort, there's got to be a I wish, I wish there were somebody who would say, let's do it, yeah. and let's do it this way. Right, right, we, right. we are not like that, right? Exactly. We're not North Korea or, or maybe China, yeah. but we're the Philippines. So a mechanism to bring about not only working together according to a set of strategies, but working faster. And I can't help but mention that the role of IT ICT is really key because it is the, the way in which things can move faster. The history of uh, innovation in the past did not have it, but now we have it. And I think the benefits obtained by Israel and Singapore and perhaps other countries, China became, got, got into it, but I think they came in um, I think they're shifting from manufacturing to services, whereas India is shifting from services. But the thing is, these things are slow if you consider uh, examples of the past, but we are in the now generation, and we have to harness the vehicle that can enable us to move and accelerate faster. Yes. So your, one of your questions is who's supposed to do it? Uh, the answer is clear, it's the government. <laughs> uh, because the government is, is the leader here, it, it's the orchestrator. But the question is, uh, the next question is how? Yes. So that's a, a real challenge because the Philippines is a democracy. So I was kind of looking at those countries that I use as examples. Uh, you've got Vietnam, you have Singapore, you have China. And one thing uh, good that's going for these countries is that they have autocratic governments. So if the central government says, let's do this, let's build a bridge, tomorrow it's done, right? Or let's say, uh, we're gonna build here a, uh, a manufacturing for optical fibers, and it's done, right? So that's the efficiency of an autocratic government. But in a democracy like India, like the Philippines, there's a lot of debates. <laughs> and so it's not so efficient in that regard. Uh, on the other hand, I also showed here uh, examples uh, of democracies like Taiwan and Israel, right? Uh, who also have become successful in terms of establishing their uh, innovation ecosystems. But there's a common thing about those two. Not only are they small, but they're under threat by their neighbors, right? 
Taiwan is under threat uh, by China and Israel by its Arab neighbors. And so um, I, I'm not making a judgment there, but it's just that that's their situation, that's their geopolitics, and therefore they had to operate within that environment. And that became an incentive for them, a tremendous incentive for them to be able to innovate and establish their innovation ecosystem. In the case of the Philippines, the Philippines has traditionally been in ri uh, rich in natural resources. It's a tropical country. <laughs> There's not a lot of enemies, and right, there's Uncle Sam, and so there's not a lot of incentives for the Philippines traditionally or historically to really become innovative and to, to rush into innovation. Thank you, sir, but before we take the next questions, may we request you to please make your questions brief and concise. Okay. Hello. Um, thank you, Dr. Quelli, for your thought-provoking presentation. Um, you mentioned that laws 8 to 10 are like icing on the cake. So it's like, you know, they are supplementary laws. And I'd like to react on um, putting the law of values as the 10th and last among the list of laws. Because if you will um, reflect on values such as cooperation, social cohesion, teamwork, partnerships. These are important values to build um, strong sectoral partnership, which you mentioned is a foundation for creating strong government, academe, um, private sector collaboration. Yes, yeah, so I'd like to correct myself. I shouldn't have said that these are icings on the cake. Uh, these are not supplementary laws. They are full-pledged laws. I was just really joking when I said that. <laughs> uh, but uh, especially law number eight, which is uh, the fourth industrial revolution, fundamental sciences, without these first seven laws, it's, it's going to be hard to really sustain and support these two here. So these two are very much dependent on these seven laws here being uh, implemented. And, and you're absolutely right, 10 should be one of the foundational laws here because uh, uh, this is foundational. It's not like uh, an effect. Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much, Giovanna, for sharing uh, your uh, ideas about the, this loss of innovation ecosystems uh, in emerging economies. My question is, um, has there been any uh, model of an innovation ecosystem that works in a virtual, in a virtual, uh, I mean, environment, where, for example, your global linkages are physically operating elsewhere, and uh, where the government you know, in a particular country, manages these things, and technopreneurship is happening somewhere. You know, and you are, uh, and they were able to, you know, connect all this and make it work. For example, in in the Philippines, uh, we have the local government. You know, it's a bit a challenge not to do, to deal with different geographical. You know, but do you think an ecosystem, a national innovation ecosystem for the Philippines, work? across, you know, from the north to the, to the south, where the, your government, seat of government is here, and then, you know. So has there been any model in the world that, uh, you know, uh, works in this kind of, uh, you know, operation? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, um, I can think of the United Kingdom, which is also an archipelago, like the Philippines. And, uh, and, and it's also like a United Kingdom. So there's Scotland, there's Wales, there's Northern Ireland, and there's England. So even historically, they're not completely one. They're, they're kind of differences. In fact, Scotland would like to secede from the UK. Um, but UK, uh, as, as a country right now, uh, is, is very much um, innovative and its innovation ecosystems in, in the various kingdoms are, are very much uh, uh, thriving. So the answer is yes. Uh, that can be done as well in the Philippines. Yeah. The lady in front, yes. Please state your name and the uh, office you're representing. 
So um, I'm Crystal. Uh, I'm from Stratsearch Foundation. So I agree with uh, sir, the, the one in red um, in terms of the fast-changing um, environment. I think it uh, it uh, it should be linked to the the policies which the government is crafting as well, because um, in terms of uh, I'm just wondering if you have checked the policies that the current government has in terms of innovation and does it, uh, what's the effect um, in terms of the innovation, uh, uh, what they call this, uh, eco uh, ecosystem in the country as well. Is it like too tight? Because I'm, I'm reading this article that it should be light and right or something. There's this term which is uh, the innova uh, innovation laws should be uh, right and light because if it's fast changing have you checked the policies in this uh, particular country i have with the department i'm talking about policies of departments like the policies of the department of trade and industry in terms of uh, supporting industry cultivating industry uh, so those those ones i have read those and those are the ones i think that are quite pertinent here Uh, no, I have not. I, I haven't uh, laid hold on any studies in the Philippines in terms of the impact of innovation ecosystems. I don't know if there's such a study that's been made. Thank you, sir. Any other question? Yes, ma'am. Hi, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Amara Amper from Department of Trade and Industry. So my question is um, related to her question, actually, because um, Actually, the first question ko is, is it uh, really necessary for a, uh, a country like Philippines to enact a law or officially like, uh, legalize it uh, under the Congress, uh, a law on innovation or an executive order maybe to, uh, to promote innovation uh, in the country? And kasi po, as of now, meron pong... Um, uh, meron po in the Congress na pinaam for for hearing siya na PH Innovation Act, which um, kung mababasa nyo po sir is ano po integrated po lahat nitong mga laws na 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 discuss nyo today. So ayon po yung isang question or integrate na lang po ba natin to sa mga programs ng DTI or DOST? Kasi sir. As of now, um, yung pong group namin in uh, with, um, we're, we're working under ano um, Yusek uh, Rafaelita Aldaba. Siya po yung uh, head for innovation. Uh, actually, meron na po kami mga roadmap, uh, Philippine Innovation Roadmap po siya. Na ang main recommendation is to create regional innovation centers, which is yung po, We would like to create. Uh, innovation, uh, regional innovation centers for this ano po, ecosystem to be built. So, ayan, sir, yung question ko po nga po is, is it important to my law or integrated na lang po siya sa mga programs ng, for example, DTI and DOST? Thank you po. Okay, so uh, with, with the first question, I'm not familiar with the law that's being proposed in the Philippine Congress, so I can't really comment on that. Uh, but in terms of this uh, innovation roadmap that you mentioned with the Department of Trade and Industry, I think in principle, I think that's great. There has to be these innovation centers in various regions in the Philippines. Now, in terms of the details of how to implement that, I'm, I'm not familiar with the details. But I think the principle is good. Yes, sir. Um, hi, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Kenneth Garcia from the IIT and Business Process Association of the Philippines, or IBPAP. Um, just a question, sir. So, so my first question would be fundamental sciences. So in the 21st century, so would this be your traditional ones, your chemistry, your physics, or would this be your more advanced ones, like automation, um, big data, the advanced neural networks, advanced ones? Then, sir, my second question would be, um, basing on this diagram, so it seems that, yeah, it's um, the ones in the lower part would be your prerequisites for the higher um, laws. Just to check, um, you mentioned that government would be the main driver of this, but of course, in the private sector, we would also want to help. Um, in what stage are we in, in terms of the law or in this framework? 
Um, or is it a combination of all these laws and its interplaying? Is that clear, ba? Uh, no, I'm not clear about the question. Okay, so the question would be, um, in what laws are we good in already in the country? Yes. The Philippines. Oh, in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. I think that would depend on the particular sector. Uh, so, for instance, in IT, right, I would imagine that's more advanced here. Um, let's see. <laughs> oh, it's somewhere here. <laughs> on the third level, probably. Yeah. But, but I think that IT still needs uh, a lot of coordination. Okay, let me talk about one particular industry, and this is the, uh, uh, the business process management, the IT business process management. That's the one that I know is really further advanced in the Philippines. Um, in terms of global linkages, in terms of whole government approach, uh, well, it's not really doing manufacturing. It doesn't apply. Value linkages, probably. Uh, and I don't know about technopreneurship. I think it needs a lot of technopreneurship. And I'm not sure about technology transfer as well. So I think a lot of the sectors in the Philippines are really up to here. And I don't mean to say that four, five, six, and seven are fully met. But that's where they're at. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, ma'am, at the back. It's you. <laughs> oh. Sorry. I noticed that you, your number one is uh, sector participation, uh, partnership, okay? But unfortunately, in the Philippines, sector partnership is not very strong, especially with the industry, okay? And well, with no strong partnership because even if they want to help in, in the innovation or, or give them to the factory or to the private companies, the uh, pri private partners would not want or it's not very uh, well comfortable with the local innovation. Probably nowadays uh, it's improving, no? But at least the uh, private sector partnership is really very weak, very weak. So how do you make it strong? Probably you could teach us how to do it. Well, in China, your, your, your sample is China, but you know, government is very strong in China and they just dictate it, okay? okay. With, the other company, with the other countries that you have, probably Singapore is different, but it's not really very different, you know? They have but, a very yeah. strong government, okay? So how would you really uh, increase or probably make the partnership with private sector or with the manufacturing sector to be able to really be, uh, I would say, they will believe on the uh, innovation that were being made by the university? Thank you. And by private sector, you're referring to the domestic private sector, right? You're referring to the domestic private sector. Is that correct? Yes, I, I think the context is that you're referring to the domestic private sector. Yes, yes, yes. Right, right. Yes, yes, yes. So currently, the Department of Trade and Industry has this effort really to link a lot of these private sectors, small, medium enterprises, in the supply chain of the global companies or, or the multinational corporations. That's how Singapore does it, and it's been successful. And I think uh, the Philippines learned from Singapore and is doing the same thing. So I'm really hoping that that would work out. Before we entertain the next question, may I request everybody to please fill up the evaluation forms before you leave the office, uh, before you leave the, <laughs> the seminar. Okay, so on to the next question. Uh -huh, yes, sir. Dr. Coelho, uh, my, per my question is on a personal note. My, my son is finishing high school in April, and he wants to take up BS Physics uh, in whichever university will accept him. Is it a good time for him? Because 30 years ago, I, my cuento kola, 30 years ago, I also went into physics, but I, I could sense now when I graduate. Firstly, I, I, I realized I wasn't a good student. It was tough. So I, I, secondly, I realized that uh, you know, I might end up just teaching. 
N nothing against teaching. In fact, I want to teach when I, when I retire, if somebody will allow me to teach. But now my son wants to follow into my footsteps. So is it a good time for him to take up you know, a science, uh, science course uh, at this time? All right, to be fair, I would say if that's really his passion, then let him do it. But I would recommend to you to recommend to him or to advise to him uh, that he also uh, pay attention to entrepreneurship and the private sector in, and, and connecting his specialty and expertise in physics in terms of value creation in the private sector. I think that would really position him in a strong uh, uh, area. Okay. <laughs> Uh -huh. Dr. Concepcion has a question. Yes. Can we take her question? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Joel, thanks for the great talk. This is Gisela Concepcion from UP. I'd like to uh, focus on uh, law number two, which is the whole government approach. It's related to uh, the question of our... Uh, uh, from DTI, uh, the question being, is there a need for an innovation act? And we know that there is a draft. So I think, uh, yes, a bit. Oh, well, it was communicated to us. But um, existing are the IP uh, code, the uh, PESA um, Act, the um, um, procurement law, and others that are important in creating an ecosystem. So I would like to uh, suggest perhaps that the PIDS would consider uh, revising or filling the gaps in these existing uh, laws to um, um, support the concept of the STE innovation ecosystem. In the ecosystem, as we know it, in uh, the forests or even in the marine ecosystem, there are enabling and disabling conditions. So we know for a fact from the university that there are disabling um, provisions or conditions or processes in those existing laws. So may I suggest that the PIDS address this issue urgently and um, in line with what this administration has uh, done in terms of foreign direct investments, which is to expand the coverage of the FDIs to include foreign experts, that perhaps we could create what you call enabling eco zones, no longer just PESA zones, but eco zones to include um, products and services that would benefit not just uh, uh, foreign countries, for, you know, export foreign countries, but uh, the uh, local consumers as well. So just call it an echo zone and um, find ways to allow the uh, foreign experts to augment our local experts uh, to work uh, uh, well uh, under competitive conditions, allow the importation of key instruments and facilities that would seed the, uh, the ecosystem uh, as well as supplies, because these are the disabling uh, conditions that we face in the university. And immediately after, you would have industry. So uh, in line with the whole government approach, I think it's fantastic that uh, the, in the Israel model, you have uh, the technology transfer company that uh, would allow um, incentives or um, promotional um, provisions for the global industries to uh, invest in the country and eventually uh, perhaps buy some of the uh, startups, the local startups. Um, Another suggestion is to um, establish not just um, a PhD professional masters in technopreneurship or postdoctoral programs um, for training our uh, human um, capital, but also to establish the shorter term certificated training programs that are now um, pervasive in uh, countries like Taiwan, uh, Singapore, 
South Korea because the technology moves so fast. So if you have this um, cater of Filipinos who are trained um, and updated regularly, then I think uh, you would al allow this STE innovation ecosystem to flourish. Okay, thank and you, I'll Giselle. ask, uh, Joel, what is the first um, industry that you would recommend as an STE innovation ecosystem? In the Philippines? Uh, <laughs> well, the Department of Trade and Industry did their studies, and I think I showed that slide where uh, you have the target industries, uh, including shipbuilding, including automotive, and so on and so forth. So they did the studies and the market, so I think those are reliable. Yeah. More questions? But just one comment. Uh, Dr. Conception is absolutely right about the whole government approach. Uh, the, uh, the government really needs to take the lead in terms of uh, making the conditions in the country really conducive uh, for business. So ease of doing business, uh, ease of international procurement, uh, all of those things really uh, need to be done by uh, the government so that uh, potential obstacles and limitations uh, for both local companies and international companies of doing business in the emerging country uh, can be uh, removed. Okay. Sir, the back. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Sir Joel, thank you for a very good presentation. I'm Richard Eason from the UP Electrical Electronics Engineering Institute, one of the units in the university that's churning out uh, really exciting research for the country. <clears throat> Uh, my initial question would be regarding a model on how we can grow the technology innovation hub for the Philippines. So I noticed that in Singapore, MNCs are really driving the R&D. And when you look at the, the, the graph or the chart that was shown earlier, we do have that in terms of the electronics industry, wherein actually all of the manufacturing are spearheaded by the <coughs> MNCs, right? So the question now is, how do we capture or how do we use the Singapore model to actually motivate these MNCs so that we can go on to that level four, wherein the manufacturing and the industrial R&D becomes you know, part of one uh, unit. So we've had some success with this, with this particular uh, endeavor in that we were able to support one of the uh, MNCs here, so analog devices. They're actually starting to build their own uh, ICs here in the Philippines that are designed by That's Filipino great. engineers. But unfortunately, in my time dealing with the electronics industry, what I've noticed is that MNCs aren't really interested in starting R&D opportunities in the Philippines. Do you so, know why? That's the thing. Uh, that's something that we need to answer. What I've noticed is if the manager or the CEO of the company is Filipino, he will be the one to drive that this particular unit in the Philippines should have that R&D capability. But if that CEO is for, say, coming from other countries, it's just about you know, manufacturing efficiently and that's it. There's no vision to really uh, put capacity in the Philippines for technolo technological innovation, for example. So I think we need to address that. Um, how do we start convincing these MNCs that there is talent here? Right. And the way to do it should be institutionalized. It shouldn't be like you, a professor at UP, right? Yeah. Uh, to be convincing these multinational corporations to bring their uh, R&D centers here in the Philippines. That's the Department of Trade and Industry. That's the Board of Investment. So uh, the government, through the Department of Trade and Industry, really should have a clearly articulated set of incentives uh, to these multinational corporations to incentivize them to set up shop uh, here in the Philippines for their R&D centers. And you know the incentives could be in terms of tax holidays, uh, in terms of infrastructures, 
in terms of facilities, in terms of availability of experts, in terms of access to laboratories in universities and research institutions. And of course, DTI should not do it alone. DTI should coordinate with DOSD, because DOSD has its own research centers as well, and with the universities and research institutions in the Philippines. So again, this is necessary here, the whole government approach. Sorry, just one more question. Yes. Regarding the ECI index that was shown earlier, Oh, no. Sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, the, the EC index, Electro uh, Economic Contribution Index, okay. is it that? I just noticed that Singapore leads uh, Israel in terms okay. of the economic... Uh, the knowledge economic, intensity. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I find that uh, surprising, knowing okay. that, uh, uh, for example, uh, Israel yes. actually has more uh, startup companies, R and D centers, yeah. more R and D centers yeah. than Singapore. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know whether the data is correct or there is something more that's happening in Singapore than what we actually see. Or maybe based on the specific criteria that uh, were used to uh, come up with that listing and ranking. Okay. Yes. Anyway, so thank you. You can look into it more closely. Yes. Okay, Dr. Kimba, you were raising your hands a while back. What's your question, please? Um, maybe just to build on the discussion earlier on the role of, of conflict and threats on the drive to innovate, um, I think we have seen the correlation in the, the countries, for example, Singapore or Taiwan or even South Korea, that uh, because they are faced with conflict or the threat to survive, they were pushed to innovate. And and I think what we are saying is that the Philippines being rich and having all of these um, uh, protection from other factors. We don't have the drive, but I think what we see these days is that uh, the threat of um, disaster is actually an issue, or is actually pushing a lot of innovations. We have seen a number of tech innovations that are actually uh, providing some services to um, Im to address the, the need to communicate during disasters or even some other ways of, of um, innovation. Um, so that's, that's one comment. And then I was thinking earlier, uh, uh, eh, well, anyway, uh, I'll just end my comment there. No, but, but that is correct, because uh, today there's a lot of threats uh, that are, uh, you know, uh, here in the Philippines already uh, because the population has grown. So you can't really say that the Philippines is still uh, rich in natural resources. In a way it is, but we ab absolutely know that it's not enough. So that's one threat. <laughs> Thank you. Any additional comments, sir? Yeah, I'll go back to the macros because the, the micro thing is perhaps uh, not 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 uh, not big enough to overcome the the issue that we are facing. Okay, I, I wanted to ask you if you can comment on the priority between services as a development as a as a way of developing our economy versus. Manufacturing. I'm not saying one or the other. I'm, I'm, I'm really saying perhaps balancing them. Where do you emphasize at the beginning? Would it be services rather than manufacturing? Considering that in manufacturing, competition for the production of products is very, uh, how shall I put it? Uh, among countries, among countries. We, we, we say automotive, what do we do? We assemble. We don't manufacture engines. We don't. But when we say services, we can be global. And therefore, if you think about growing the economy faster, I was wondering if you can think of a model which says perhaps we should put priority on services at the beginning, and then perhaps as we move along, we go to manufacturing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my thought on that is that it should be in parallel uh, because it's proven that uh, countries that are doing manufacturing, they really advance a lot. And also because manufacturing offers a lot of jobs. 
uh, with, with services, they do offer a lot of jobs as well. But if you compare the wages in service industry and manufacturing, wages are much higher in manufacturing, particularly when the manufacturing becomes knowledge intensive and more geared towards science and technology. Uh, now, of course, um, when one is just starting with manufacturing, one has to start pretty much at the bottom. But then you advance as you gain the skills, as you gain the, uh, as you gain the infrastructure or develop the infrastructures for manufacturing. I mean, China is one classic example. Uh, they started manufacturing really, really at a low level, but now they're really advanced. Uh, because they have that manufacturing ecosystem and they were able to apply technologies into manufacturing, best practices, and so on and so forth. And so now they're really a powerhouse in manufacturing. Okay. Sir, yeah. may we know your name and your yeah. office? Yeah, please? this time. <laughs> I'm Alvin uh, Colaba from Dallas University. Yeah, um, I think uh, I know, going back to that I know, proposed innovation act, now, maybe there's something that uh, they can look at. No? Um, the traditional natin, uh, na way of trying to connect no? between the academic uh, government and, and industry uh, hasn't worked and is not working. Um, one of the main reasons there is really uh, no, the industry it, it requires a lot of trust, you know, with, with their collaborators, with, with industry, much more with the government. Now, how do you think uh, if, uh, no, no, yung government and the academe, sila yung, ano, lalapit ngayon sa, ano, sa industry? Like a cluster and of... Just to be clear, when you say industry, you're talking about local industry, yes? Local, I'm mean, okay, local industry. Uh, because that's really, really what, uh, what we want, right? uh, to have a close uh, relationship or collaboration or partnerships amongst the three, you know, sectors. What happens now is that uh, in universities, like I'll give you a very specific example. Back in early 90s, there was a program in government that involved the private sector institutions like, like La Salle, no? and of course the government, UP and all the rest. Um, they provided equipment, okay? Uh, they provided the scholarship to train key people. Uh, si Dr. Tansina, sana yan. So, product kami nun, no? So, we were sent abroad in specific areas that the government actually has identified as priority. Okay? And then, uh, ang university, binigyan din ng, ng equipment. Pri I'm talking about the private sector, ha, because I come from the private sector. Binigyan ng equipment, binigyan kami nun. So, that pagbalik namin, when we come, uh, when we came back, we have something to, to work on, no? So we were able to develop, uh, no, and uh, true enough, naman, no? We have done a lot in terms of research. Uh, so that's government funded, that's a private sector, ano? Pero nasan yung industry? Diba? Wala, wala yung industry. Ibig sabihin, you produce masters, PhDs. Where do we, do, where do they go? You know, the private sector cannot absorb it. So, ang industry ang kailangan. Problema, they are away. They are, ano, para sabihin, para it's difficult for them to go to your, your institution or your, your place, no? So, if we do it the other way around, you have a group of companies, for example, 10 companies located, with, let's say, in, in, in uh, semiconductor or what. What if the government goes there? Uh, to, to put up the R&D facilities that will be necessary, uh, you know, to help the productivity, the, you know, of this group of companies. And the government, uh, I mean, those people trained by the government has been sent abroad, no? Or, you know, will be placed also there, like, you really force them to, to work together it's, uh, so that the relationship can be built. Sa una, ayaw nila. Pero paano? Nandiyan na, di ba? Para ba nang liligaw na... Ba? Nandiyan na eh. Later on, okay naman pala eh, di ba? The, the, the trust is, is starting to, to, ano, to uh, build. Huh? And then, later on, naskita nila pala na... And then, transparent. They can see, uh, the industry can see what, you know, is happening in, the, in that place. And the people, every day, they go there. Oh, so this is a, so it, 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 it will take time. No? Because that is really our problem here. 
the relationship between the industry and the academe no is not really you know, your trust is not there that's really the you know, in fact in the last study by by stride it really came out no na yun ang nagiging problema so until now we have been here for the last 20 years since we came back still doing research and pero wala pa rin yung, yung industry and uh, Dr. Tasik can attest to that di ba ma'am oh Nag-invest ang government sa amin, nag-invest ang government sa equipment, tama man? It's there. But the industry yung problema eh. Wala yung ano. Maybe because nga baka malayo nga yata tayo, ma'am. Ano? Kung, kung uh, probably uh, ang lasal, no? Sige, uh, dadalhin namin yung... yung, uh, yung remember, ma'am, you, you gave us the Science and Technology Research Center. It's a building. A building with an equipment. Probably that building should have been built beside this, this, ano, this uh, industries and andun talaga. Parang ipipilit mo yung sarili mo doon. And then kami na, uh, who were sent abroad, may mga manufacturing, AI, artificial intelligence. My God, that was, Dr. Dad Jones has been there for the last 20 years. I've been doing that. Imagine. Pero wala nga at that time, ano riba? Kung na kami dinala doon sa tabi ng mga industry na yon. Maybe by now we could have been married, uh, di ba? With the industry and then ano yon. Maybe I'm not sure. Nanganak na, oh, oh, may apu na. Probably because it relationship yun eh. Maybe we just have to think about the different way to to build that relations. Because now it's not really working. Now yung siya sabi na DTI with all the roadmaps. What is that? The academy doesn't even know your roadmaps. Diba? What is the truth to match what we should be doing? Diba? Where is it kept? So we're waiting for the DTI to connect them to, to the industry with the government. Of course, they are government. You know, it doesn't work. And it's not working. Diba? So let's do it the, the other way. Ang problema dito is, will it allow that particular, ano yon na pwede bang government mag-fund, magtayo ng building no, na beside, ano, and then another cluster of industry, ganun din. Diba? Ang ipapadala natin ng mga... Right now, no, we have several hundreds of scholars. We are sending abroad, or even locally lang, being trained. But pag-graduate nila, where do they go? Meron ako mga graduate, I send them for postdoc outside the in Taiwan, Korea. Nandun na sila. Because we could not absorb it, K-12. We don't have space for hiring, ano, walang teaching load. Walang. So, but they are graduating. We're producing them. Diba? Okay lang kung UP, I mean, without students, you can hire them. You can, but even then, diba? Uh, Giselle, no? We still have, we don't really have much spaces for our, you see, Giselle, work very hard how to absorb them, diba? But there's still a lot na wala pa rin. May mga PhD na ngayon. Not everyone wants to go to teaching like, you know, our colleague here. Yeah. They really need to know. That's why I think there must be a different model that we have to think about. And the government must uh, so are they uh, pwede ba ito sa policy? Nasa na yung PIDS? Si Dr. Reyes. May policy ano ba ito na pwede yung isang government fund I ilagay doon parang ganon, di ba? A private institution ipabuild mo doon ng, ano, in a partnership? I don't know. But this is uh, the way I probably see that, uh, you know, ipipilit mo talaga uh, yung, yung mga researchers and R&D to the industry. At first, they don't like it. They won't like it. They, especially with the small and medium enterprises. Sa value chain, uh, ano yun. Kasi multinational, it's really difficult. Pero kung ilipa, ano mo yan doon, palagay ko. And then, they benefit from that. It's a partnership that they can, ano, because they had to see what we are doing, eh, what as scientists are doing, and technologists, and engineers are doing. Kailangan transparent sa kanila yun na we are doing for. We don't have vested interest, you know, ba? I don't know. Maybe it may work. So thank you, Alvi. You raised uh, quite a number of points. So the, one of the things that you mentioned is, you know, the Philippines, for instance, could send students abroad. They could get their masters, they could get, get their PhDs. But once they go back, they don't have any jobs, right? And so uh, a large portion of those scholars end up study or working abroad. And so that is brain drain. This is not unique for the Philippines, Saudi Arabia, which is a rich country. They send a lot of their young people to the US, Europe, everywhere. 
to get their bachelors, their masters, their PhDs. Well, one of the headaches that Saudi Arabia currently has, a lot of these young people graduate, they finish, they go back to Saudi Arabia, they don't have jobs. <laughs> and so that is why uh, Saudi Arabia now has this Vision uh, 2030 program uh, so that they could really diversify their economy. It's not just petroleum, but they could have other innovative industries as well that could absorb a lot of these engineers, a lot of these scientists, and other uh, business majors who come back. Um, the other question that you have is... Um, this one here, which is the cooperation between government companies and universities. Uh, let me go back to something here. Okay, here. So we're interested in both global companies and small medium enterprises. Why? Well, because global companies, they're big. <laughs> they have money. They can create jobs. And gee, the Philippines needs a lot of jobs for its science, scientists and engineers. Those can be provided by these big companies here, like those IT companies that you mentioned. But the Philippines, and I'm talking about the Philippines, but I'm talking about emerging economies in general, also need to develop their own local or domestic small-medium enterprises. And again, the way that Singapore does this, and it's been successful, is to link the SMEs with the supply chain of these uh, global manufacturing companies. And it's worked uh, successfully. Uh, and, and now the Department of Trade and Industry, I know that uh, Secretary Lopez, this is one of his initiatives, is really to explicitly link the SMEs uh, to the uh, supply chain and the value chain of the global manufacturing uh, companies. You said that historic historically there's a lack of trust between uh, the local SMEs and universities and perhaps government. I'm not familiar with that, but in my mind, it's, it's really a matter of the business model. If the company could see the benefits that they would have in this partnership and cooperation, they're going to go for it. Uh, you know, they're, they're business people. Uh, they're weighing the pros and the cons. If the pros in their mind exceeds uh, the cons, they would go for it. So I think that in every cooperation between government, academe, and the companies or industry, the business model, the business, prop, uh, the value proposition to the company has to be absolutely clear. If the value proposition to them is absolutely clear that they can see the advantages uh, to them, they would definitely go for it. So with this SMEs being linked to the supply chain of these global companies, they would totally go for it. Why? Because it kind of assures them their income, their revenues, uh, because these companies need whatever they're supplying. Yeah. Oh, one last comment is you said about, you talked about the physical proximity. That is very important as well. Uh, in Israel, uh, there was a military installation that was set up in um, uh, the desert, Beersheba. And because of that, even multinational corporations followed them. And they set up um, uh, their facilities close to that military installation because there's also a university there, Ben Gurion University. And so there's an innovation ecosystem that formed in the middle of that desert. Yeah. I just want to add to what Dr. Kulaba said earlier about the roadmap. I think uh, our friend here from DTI has already relayed your information to DTI secretary, and maybe we can furnish them a copy of the roadmap. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So I think. Okay. Okay. So I think I have to agree that uh, there's a, a lot of like gaps in terms of policies and implementation. I think, uh, uh, I think no na nga yung Pilipinas na, the, na marami na tayong laws and marami na tayong policies, but um, in terms of implementation, talagang bagsak. So I think we have to address that as well. And another one na merong gap is, like you said po, yung supply ng talents and the demand. Ang question ko is, yung katulad ng Kaiser, how can we create the demand if there's no market for it? So I think um, 
Sir, yung uh, comment ko dun sa number one, which is partnership, I wonder if we should add the citizens or the civic society, because they're the one who will be, uh, who's the, the market itself, who will create the demand for the, for the SME, for the entrepreneurs and all. And I think in terms of policy making, they would have a, a great uh, help as well or assistance because they will be the one who's like and, um, acting in terms of the policies itself. It's the citizens who will, you know, accept the policies. And um, yeah. uh, so I, my question there would be, um, perhaps we should look into the acceptance of the citizens as well, um, especially for the innovation part. Because I think um, lahat kami, we, we, we agree that it's the wave of the future. But uh, how about the ones um, which are senior citizens or the ones from the province itself? Perhaps we should address the technological and um, digital divide in terms of the, yeah, the innovation itself. Sure, absolutely. And, uh, <clears throat> Well, one thing I can guarantee in terms of the reaction of civil society to having an innovation ecosystem is that they're going to be happy because it creates jobs and it provides wages. So that is a, a big bonus for civil society. Uh, you mentioned about markets. We're always talking about two markets here, the domestic market and the international market. Now, of course, you can't ignore the size of the domestic market in the Philippines. The population of the Philippines now is what? Uh, 105, yes. 107 million, yes. Right, uh, now, if you look at Israel and Singapore, their populations are low. Uh, and in fact, uh, in the case of Israel, which is surrounded by its political enemies, uh, it really is constricted in terms of its market. And so that is why in Israel, from day one, an Israeli domestic company is built to sell to the global market. It's for export. And that is why the standards have always been high, and, and that is why it's able to penetrate uh, foreign markets. And I think that it's good to have that kind of orientation, because uh, if your standard is the world, then for sure you will meet the standard of the locals as well. And if you want to come up with a good enough version of that technology uh, to make it cheaper, more affordable to the locals, that's easier, to, uh, that's easy to do. Um, so yeah, in terms of industry or companies, we're always targeting local companies and global companies. When we're talking about markets, we're always talking about domestic market and international market as well. But when you talk about scale up, you're always talking about the international market. And when you're talking about industry, we can't ignore the global businesses. Why? They have the money, they have the capital, and there needs to be production of jobs so that locals could be employed. Sure, sir. Yeah, please. Uh -huh. You know, a few years back, we created these call centers and BPI and so on. And you know why? The first idea was employment. But I think if you think beyond that idea, it's also the idea that we can provide our services globally, which we are, right? And we're benefiting from that because such services are also available locally. We develop the technology. We develop the expertise and so on. So my, my point is, perhaps we should come up with things that are really unique to the situation in our country. I, I'm, I'm sorry to bring this up, but when we speak of ecosystems, there are seven things that I remember. One is policy, strategy, processes, information, technology, applications, and stakeholders. I remember those seven because that's in my field. I believe ecosystems can use that model in the same way that we have adapted ecosystems approach from the biological systems. We can adapt. But the point is, we cannot just have laws, right? You, you say that's policy. 
And then there is IRR, that's implementation. But who is implementing? We should consider the totality of, this is what the ecosystems approach that you were referring to in your talk. We have to think holistically in terms not only of who are participants, but what they do as participants. And so my, my last point is that this is, this is something very recent policy, third telco player, okay? And this is a controversial thing, but I want to bring it up. I have a feeling that what is missing is the creation of the demand for the services that telecoms companies can provide. Uh, you know why? Because telecoms companies today are only providing homogeneous services as if people and companies, big and small, are the same. But the needs are different, and therefore we need to have a strategy to create that demand that will justify the supply of broadband that will reach all over the countryside. I'm saying this because this is the 25th year of internet in our country. And we should think about how the internet can play a role in really doing all these things uh, in terms of, uh, what do you call this, energizing the people rather than the universities or the government and the industries. There are people who can contribute to our economy who can raise the wealth, but they need to be provided those opportunities. And the fastest way to do that is to reach them. And the telecommunication companies have succeeded to a certain extent. They promoted communications, which is equivalent to chismes, but not productivity or services. This is, this is uh, an example of what I mean by perhaps the services in our country was a good thing, and perhaps by developing it even further to uh, include services to small and medium scale enterprises, Absolutely. resorts, hotels, yeah. health, education, etc., yeah. it will accelerate the creation of wealth that is needed to fund all the innovations that I think we need. Thank you. Definitely, services is part of the equation here. <clears throat> so, just to clarify, I talked here about the laws of innovation ecosystems in emerging economies. So these are the common principles uh, in all of the emerging economies that have succeeded in building their innovation ecosystems. Implement implementation, though, is specific to a country. So if you look at these countries here, emerging economies that have successfully built their innovation ecosystems, there's not one common set of implementation uh, protocols that they implemented. In fact, it varied widely, uh, especially between a communist country or an autocratic, uh, autocratically controlled uh, government uh, and a liberal democracy uh, government. So implementation really varies a lot. But these are common, though, among all of them. We're down to our three last questions. OK. okay. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, uh, Miss Sarah, Miss Amara, sorry. Um, it's actually, eh, hindi po, more, hindi po ito more on a question, more of like, siguro sharing lang on the, on what is DTI doing regarding this innovation ecosystem. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have the program na, uh, uh, based on the recommendation of roadmap, uh, we would like to create uh, the regional innovation uh, ec uh, ecosystems or centers. Na uh, this will form in uh, ecosystems na merong meron itong mga ten laws na nabanggit ni sir. So as of now, um, meron na kami mga target regions, uh, which in which include yung uh, CDO, Cebu, Davao and then Bicol, and I think Calabarzon is included. So with the help of USAID, um, um, they study uh, kung ano yung parang specific product. Kasi na pwede nilang 
uh, create uh, mag-create ng ecosystem. Like for example in Bicol, um, based dun sa um, FG din nila with them, we are uh, kasama yung government, industry, academe, ang napili nila is pili. So, yung pili. <laughs> Agriculture manager. So, pili. So, from there, so, at least, sir, um, kumbaga, ito, ito na, whole of government approach, sector partnership, uh, we're trying na, na ma-address yung, katulad nga nung sabi ni sir, from, from Lazal na, uh, it's always yung kumbag kumbaga yung academe laging nabibigyan sila ng mga scholarship but hindi naman nagagamit dito so this ecosystem this uh, these centers uh, will try to ano to 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 address to collaborate with everyone lalo na po yung mga MSMEs natin kasi um kasi in in those yung mga Cebu Davao CDO very active po yung yung mga MSME natin and yung mga academic and industry players po natin doon. So, hopefully, um, with, the, with the leadership of Secretary Lopez and the help of our USEC, uh, USEC Aldaba, um, maging successful po yung pag-create ng innovation ecosystems in the Philippines. And thank you. Dr. Kimba. Uh, Sir, the, the study or the presentation was premised on the lessons of globalization uh, uh, in fostering innovation. And so given the, the recent developments uh, in globalization, in the global economy, for instance, the US-China trade, trade war, the loss in uh, multi trust in the multilateral system, the you know, populist policies, inward-looking policies. So how would these laws evolve or change and or, or which of these laws would change um, I, I really personally believe strongly that um, the phase we're in right now where there's trade wars where countries are more inward-looking that's just a phase as soon as uh, President Trump is out of office <laughs> it's <laughs> It's going to be back to um, the normal course, I would say, yes. Uh, because, um, okay, so at the very heart of globalization, and I teach this in my class in globalization, there's a globally integrated enterprise. Uh, do you know how a globally integrate, uh, integrated enterprise works? So you have a company, you break up the company it's into its constituent functions, manufacturing, uh, um, <laughs> research and development, uh, sales, right? And then you locate each function wherever in the world, whichever country in the world, where that function could be done in the cheapest possible way. That is the most optimal form of a company right now. And that is why all of the globally integrated enterprises right now are posting record profits. They're never go going to go back to the old form of a company. So globalization cannot be reversed. Uh, that's my opinion. And, and I think that it's, uh, it's got some really solid basis. Uh, and I know, yeah. So it's hard because they're making record profits. Now, the only problem in the US and other developed countries is the record profits that these companies are making, they're not being shared equitably to the members of the civil society. But that's an altogether different challenge. From a company's perspective, globalization is the best uh, mode for them to operate in. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, yes, yes. You're in bio, uh, bioengineering, right? Biosystems bio Bioengineering? Biosystems engineering. Okay. Uh, in your experience, how did you apply the 10 laws of innovation uh -huh. uh, in regarding your, your projects in the university? Uh -huh. Yeah, so uh, again, these are 10 laws of innovation for building national innovation ecosystems. So these do not directly apply to individual projects. However, I'm, I'm happy to say <laughs> that I'm always inspired by innovation. So my laboratory, which is the Biosystems Engineering Group at the University of Arizona, currently has 10 patents uh, or pending patents uh, 
in the last five years or so. And uh, we really, uh, we have more in the pipeline. Uh, and so, just like Singapore, Singapore is very uh, clear and explicit in terms of relating its research to innovation. Innovation is value creation. You create value, that's innovation. Research, innovation, then enterprise. And so I'm following that as well. So we're doing research, and through research, we're developing innovation or value, original value. That's why we're able to patent it. And we're cooperating as well with private companies uh, that, we, that fully intend to commercialize these uh, innovations. And so that's the thing that's not realized yet, and I'm waiting for it. <laughs> uh, that would be very personally rewarding if that happens. Sir? Um, hello. Um, it's just like uh, sharing as well of what we're doing in IB property industry. Okay, so actually the internet connectivity will really help us so that we can reach the rural areas or the provinces because we really want to bring the jobs to the provinces, not only in Metro Manila and other centers. And in terms of the um, jobs or uh, in terms of the demand for this um, highly um, skilled um, individuals in the country. So our track now is based on our roadmap 2022. So we're um, upscaling, reskilling our workforce. So we want to get more of the PhDs, the masters, um, graduates, and other um, highly intellectual individuals so that we can um, be able to leverage the technology such as automation, such as big data, um, internet of things. So these are all, uh, are all aligned in what we're um, thinking of as the digital Filipino. So as we mentioned, so instead of the Filipino people going out of the country, we want them to stay here and the global companies can go here and um, transfer their technologies, transfer their expertise, so that we can develop our workforce as well. So in IBPAP, so we have several talent development programs. So for example, for the, for the fresh graduates, we have the different industry awareness fairs. So we encourage the fresh graduates um, to check on our industry. So there's a portal where they can access the different jobs, the different functions, the salary, so that they can see for themselves where they'll be, uh, where they'll be relevant at. So for example, um, yeah, so that's one. Another would be we have industry academic linkages. So we partner a lot with the different academies. Um, we have internship programs, we have hackathons, we have different um, uh, immersion programs for the faculty members so that we can also help in developing our industry but as well providing jobs to the academe, the practitioners as well. Another would be in terms of technopreneurship, um, we're also very into developing the new breed of innovators in the country. So we have the takeoff programs. So last year we had um, we had featured um, 40 startups in the country. We linked them up to the different um, ITBPM global players so that we are ensured that uh, that we'll have fresh talent coming in in the industry and we'll see more of these ideas flowing in since we're into the digital millennial age as well. So yeah, and I think and I agree that there has to be more collaboration between the government and the Shin Academy. And yeah, we're very hopeful and we're very optimistic that we'll, be, uh, we'll get there in the future. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I think we have more guests here. Uh, yes. Do you have any questions or do you have any comments? <laughs> Whether my name is Augustine Nye, I hail from West Africa to be specific Liberia, and I'm a student of uh, the University of the Philippines, okay. Los Banias. Right. And uh, this is one of the requirements of one of my courses, which is uh, DM224, to attend a seminar of my choice to write about it and make a report on it in my section to come. But uh, first of all, I'd like to extend my Thanks and profound gratitude to you as a citizen, I think, for the Philippines because I heard, I heard from you from the beginning that you, you were born here, you grew up here, and uh, you attended, I think, UP Los Banos, something I did. like that. So uh, 
As a citizen that have uh, acquired such a knowledge, for me, what uh, I would feel is that you help the Filipinos or the Philippines in order for them to see reason to not be like locking behind the other countries because you are an access to this nation. So um, I think it will be like okay for you to come here and help your people for this nation to go further because you are a brain. Instead of you uh, having the uh, establishment in the various countries around, I think it is okay for you to come and talk with the government to see how you people can collaborate to help your country to go further. Thank you so much. It's, it's my privilege, privilege. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, thank you for the comments. Sir, uh, there's uh, one last question from an online viewer. Oh, okay. His name is Vince Tobias. The involvement, and the question is, the involvement of the private sector is too late in the product development process, and this would likely mean that the value proposition of the new product or service will, would not be aligned to the corporate's needs. So what should corporations in the Philippines do to make it work? Okay. <laughs> uh, I think quotation po yun from, from his... <laughs> All right, so I think we, we go back to number two, the whole government approach. Uh, it's never too late. <laughs> so I think that, uh, again, the government needs to um, really uh, foster a cohesive relationship among its government units so that they can really clearly articulate the value proposition that they're offering the private companies to incentivize the private companies to cooperate with both the government and academia for the benefit of the industry. Uh, I, I think if that is made explicitly clear, it's going to be irresistible for private companies uh, not to pay attention to it or to turn it down. So again, the, the, the go whole government approach is really critical. And, and this is one thing I'd like to recommend to PIDS, to uh, direct, uh, President uh, Celia here, uh, perhaps it would be wonderful if the PIDS could conduct a study in terms of what is the optimal government configuration in the Philippines uh, to have an effective whole government approach in implementing uh, an effective uh, innovation ecosystem that involves this cohesive cooperation among government, uh, industry, and academia. Mom Sal, would you like to respond to that? Later? Okay. 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 Yes. Dr. Conception? Given our uh, illustrious um, uh, U.S.-based uh, expert scientists, uh, the problem in our country is industry will not take on um, value products developed by the local community because they do not understand the invention or the innovation. In particular, in the biotech field, no one will touch a biotech product from academe because they do not understand uh, biotech or molecular biology or chemistry all that much. And they would rather not risk uh, investing in such a um, risky product. So um, I think what's important in our country is for our government agencies uh, particularly the DOSD and DTI, to come up with this uh, group of experts in every field of um, uh, product development. And I would like to suggest foreign-based experts, particularly Filipino experts, to help um, government evaluate the products of academe and um, assure industry that they are of high quality. So that's uh, one thing lacking in our country, the lack of uh, science experts still in academe on the PhD level, but also the lack of uh, science experts and technology experts in, um, in uh, policy and decision uh, making positions. Okay, so that. 
The other comment I wanted to make is uh, that we have to address uh, agriculture, uh, food and nutrition, regardless of whatever other products we want to develop, because that on the long term will impact on the productivity of our youth as well as our adult workforce, including the innovation workforce. Therefore, if you want to move agriculture to the industrial level, to the manufacturing level, we think, or I think, and I have expressed this so many times already, that you might get the local manufacturer of, and fabricator of steel uh, to cooperate with government to support the um, uh, production of manufacturing equipment that we direly need uh, in our country, including those that would be automated or mechanized. And if you want to ask me, which company this is, this is Steel Asia of Benjamin Yao, who's got a big operation in Davao and also just uh, opened a huge operation in Bulacan. You could ask him to, um, you give him incentives to help our innovators build the equipment that we need for agricultural, agri-industrial manufacturing. The other is also um, mentioned by you, which is really the cyber structure, the broadband. Uh, connectivity. And I'd like to say this is so critical in science literacy programs, science communication to the general public. Uh, not just science communication, innovation, the value of innovation and communication to our youth and our, um, well, general public, including our government and industry leaders. I think those uh, Communicating it properly and um, effectively would go a long way in uh, promoting our advocacy towards innovation. Yes. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. In, in line with the lady's uh, comment, I would like also to say here that the OST has been doing a lot of product, uh, product innovation. Like, for example, just to give you an idea, that uh, the uh, Lagundi, that's part of it. The government tried to sell this to, or to show it to the, to the private sector that Lagundi would be a good cough syrup. So it's only Pascual who risked this to be a manufacturer of this, no? Not everybody would take the risk of what is being produced by the university with the help of the DOST. Okay? That's one thing about it, no? Like for country, the packaging. We started the packaging system in DOST. The private wants it that they will, we, the DOST will fully support it, but they want to operate it. See? And I said, no, it will be operated in the DOST. No, you know, the, the, the private industry group in the Philippines is not so good, you know? <laughs> they just want to get things. Free. That's the problem with here in the Philippines. With regards to the people, uh, technology, innovation, we have this, the, the new law that's being passed. I don't know if it's already passed, this innovation law. And unfortunately, NEDA would be the secretariat. I, I said, why NEDA? It should be one of the agencies of the DOST, which is the Philippine the, uh, Technology uh, Assistance department, okay? I, these are things that are happening in our country. Places, offices that are placed in the, uh, an office, I'm sorry if I, I know PIDS is uh, the office, you know? <laughs> but but uh, I think that this is being done wrongly, you know? That's the trouble with our country. Like for example, I'm just giving you an example. Like for example, these call centers. I said call centers, the, the Indians gave it to us because they are now do, doing innovation instead of just call centers. Are you aware of this? That's why they pass on to us to the Philippines all these call centers, you know. But the innovation part, the Indians are continuing to do it. Okay? There are a lot of things that I can say about this because I've been with the OSD. I'm, 40, I'm already retired, but I still have some connection with them. Now, regarding transfer of technology, well, sometimes you get also technologies outside, you know. Simple technologies that can be done immediately in the country. Okay? 
So these are things that are happening in the country. That's why I said, what is your experience? How, what can you teach us about this partnership with the uh, private sector, with your experience, you know? With the experience with, uh, which you have done consultancy. Thank you. Just, just those are information. So you can go to DUSD, get some assistance for services or for innovation. They can even, for example, uh, small industries now are given some equipment, but they have to pay back with no interest at all. The technologies of the DOST that they would like to apply, the uh, DOST will advance the money for the equipment. Okay, so that's without any interest at all, and they will be assisted by the, by the agency that has created this kind of technology. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Yes, so any concluding words from our speaker? Uh, well, I just want to thank everyone, really, for uh, showing up this afternoon. Uh, it's, it's been excellent interacting with all of you. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Coelho, and uh, a round of applause for him, please. Photo ops. Ah. Okay, we'd like to uh, uh, remind everyone of the evaluation sheet, please. Don't forget to fill them up and submit them to the secretariat. Uh, and that concludes our uh, program. Thank you very much for coming.